What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. It's finally starting to feel like spring around here and that makes me want to brew something like an English pale ale, like a nice pale bitter perhaps, um, which is something that I have been really wanting to do for a long time, especially since I did such a terrible job brewing the last one. Um, if you all remember uh, about a year ago, I think at this point, I had cranked out an English pale ale that was just not very good. Something went wrong with it, and it was just a disaster in general. Still put it up on the channel, but I'm going back for redemption today. I did end up tweaking that recipe just a bit. I know I said I wouldn't do that, but there are some things I want to explore a bit more in terms of making a particular type of beer, uh, specifically a pale bitter style. Not only that, but I also want to have the perfect beer for my homebrew cask setup uh, with the beer engine that I've got set up down in the basement. I want to have a cask ale, specifically a nice hoppy bitter for these nice spring days. So as I said, this is going to be designed as a cask ale recipe, which means that I'm upping the amount of hops at the very end of the boil, mainly because when you serve a beer on cask as opposed to on CO2, you're going to lose some of that uh, hoppy brightness uh, that you might otherwise get. That being said, um, if you want to make this beer and serve it on CO2, it should be just fine. It might just be a bit hoppier at the very end. If you like that sort of thing, then it's a perfect beer for it. Now, if you're curious to see the video where I set up a cask system uh, to include a beer engine and a real cask setup, as well as a uh, corny keg style cask setup on the homebrew scale, please go ahead and check out the card notification that'll pop up here in a corner. Um, I'm sure you'll be very interested to see how I actually pulled this off. And today, the beer we're brewing is going to validate that whole thing. So really quickly, before we jump into the recipe, I want to give a big shout out to Northern Brewer. They provided the ingredients for this particular batch of beer, as well as Clawhammer Supply, who manufacture the system that I've been brewing on. Today, I'll be using the 10-gallon, 240-volt electric brewing system. This uh, particular recipe is loosely inspired by a clone of Timothy Taylor's Landlord, but I did make a few changes here. So um, I guess you think of this as more of a Yorkshire style bitter, specifically considering my selection of yeast for this, which we'll talk about in a bit here. But starting out with the grist, it's a more pale grist. We're going to go with eight pounds uh, of Golden Promise for our base malt. We're going to add in half a pound of wheat to get a little nice uh, head retention character there, especially coming off the cask. I hope that does what I think it will do. And then lastly, we're going to add a quarter pound of English medium crystal malt from Thomas Fawcett. Um, this is a nice kind of like 60 lava bond crystal malt that's going to add a little bit of color, a little bit of dextrin, and a little bit of toffee character, but not too much. Now, while this beer will still be a nice malty character, most of the flavor is going to come from the hops and from the yeast. So, Moving on to the hops, as I said, we're gonna be making this a bit stronger in terms of the aroma and flavor hops at the late boil. So we're starting out with a single bittering addition of Fuggles at 60 minutes with an ounce and a half of Fuggles. Um, that'll get about 26 IBUs. And then we're gonna go forward to the 10 minute mark and we're gonna add one ounce of East Kent Goldings, um, which will add another six IBUs. And at the zero minute mark, we're finally adding one ounce each of Fuggles and East Kent Goldings. While it may not seem like a lot of hops, it's only about 32, 33 IBUs, um, the thing that's really gonna make these hops bright and come through really nicely is the water profile. We're going for something similar to uh, a scaled down version of Burton on Trent water. Very high sulfate to chloride ratio, which is gonna allow these hops to pop and uh, be very bright in their character. So our water profile we're targeting is 79 parts per million of calcium, six parts per million of magnesium, 13 parts per million of sodium, 52 parts per million of chloride, 173 parts per million of sulfate, and zero parts per million of bicarbonate. In order to get that water profile, I'm adding uh, eight grams of gypsum, two grams of epsom, one gram of sodium chloride, and two grams of calcium chloride to the mash water. And that water is just gonna be eight gallons of standard spring water. I tend to use spring water uh, versus distilled water now simply because I, it's much easier for me to get two four gallon jugs or two five gallon jugs as opposed to eight one gallon jugs. And uh, it tends to be a little bit cheaper. And the mineral concentration in the spring water versus distilled water really is negligible, especially when we're building up a water profile that has 173 parts per million of sulfate in it. It's not gonna really matter too much if you have two to five parts per million of other things in the brewing water. I've been doing this for about a year now and it's been fine. I don't see any reason uh, why there would be any issues with spring versus distilled. So if you wanna go ahead and do distilled or RO instead of spring water, you should be able to follow the same water profile. For the yeast on this beer, we are going to be using a very special one, uh, something I've been looking forward to using for a long time. 
but I'm not sure how it's going to perform. <laughs> and that is Y Yeast 1469 West Yorkshire Ale. This yeast was supposedly sourced from Timothy Taylor's brewery. It is the Yorkshire Square strain. It is uh, an interesting strain of uh, top cropping English yeast that really uh, it was designed to be fermented in an open fermenter. Um, I don't really think I'm going to be doing that today, but we'll talk more about that in the fermentation section. However, I am excited to try it and use it specifically for its ester profile. Should be really interesting to see how that turns out. And lastly, for our mash profile, it's going to be just as simple as it gets. About 152 Fahrenheit for about 60 minutes. Um, there's really no reason to mess with that too much because we have some crystal malts and dextrins in there. We have a yeast that's not really going to uh, attenuate very highly. Um, so we want to leave a little bit of residual sweetness at the back end to balance out the amount of hops that we have uh, and also that very drying water profile. I think the combination of all those things is going to result in a balanced and highly drinkable beer, so I'm very excited to get brewing. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump to the brew day. So I started out by adding 8 gallons of spring water to my 10 gallon 240 volt claw hammer supply system and heated that up to the mash temperature of 152. As I was doing this, I milled out all of the grain and I also prepared my water salts, measured those out and added those to the heating strike water. As soon as I hit that mash temperature, I mashed in with the entire grain bill. I let the mash sit for about 10 minutes before taking a small sample for a pH measurement. I saw a relatively on target pH of 5.52, so I did not make any corrections to the pH and let the mash continue for the next uh, 50 minutes. Once the mash had rested at 152 for an hour, I raised up to 170 Fahrenheit for a mash out and let it sit there for 15 minutes. And then I pulled out the grain basket and let the grain basket drain for another 15 minutes. As this was going on, I went ahead and raised the whole thing up to a temperature just under boiling to keep ourselves from having a boil over while the basket was draining. Once I hit the boil, I added my first top addition, which was an ounce and a half of Fuggles. And then I let the boil continue for another 50 minutes until the 10 minute mark where I added one ounce of East Kent Goldings. And I also added in some World Flock and uh, yeast nutrient as well. 10 minutes later, I ended the boil and added one more ounce of East Kent Goldings and one more ounce of Fuggles. At this point, I performed a whirlpool, uh, allowing all the hops and trube to coagulate in a nice, neat cone in the center of the kettle before transferring over through my counterflow chiller and into uh, my fermenter. Once the wort in the fermenter reached the target pitch temperature of 65 Fahrenheit, I added in my one liter starter of Yeast 1469 West Yorkshire Ale and I took an OG measurement, finding it to be a lot higher than planned at uh, 1048, which was five points higher than planned. But no worries, I don't mind this turning into an ESB. So I just wrapped up the brew day, but let's talk about the fermentation and then how I'm gonna actually package this beer and serve it on cask. So first of all, I specifically chose Yeast 1469 because it is a Yorkshire ale yeast. Um, this is a specific kind of English yeast that hails from, obviously, the region of Yorkshire. Traditionally, though, these yeasts were actually fermented open and in these uh, vats called Yorkshire squares. And uh, as such, this yeast really did evolve to be used as an open fermenter. Um, because it creates this massive Krausen, you can do that if you want to, and if your conditions uh, really are favorable for it. Unfortunately, mine are not. As you can see, I'm in the basement. This is where I ferment, um, and because it's spring, there is a slight risk for contamination, specifically like mold type contamination to occur if I was to open ferment here in the basement. So I'm not gonna be doing that personally, but if you want to try that and you have a slightly better situation, I would highly recommend you go for it. I've done it a few times with the vice beer yeast, which is a very similar effect. It will create a higher level of esters, which is really good for the beer. Specifically, these British ales too have unique kind of esters uh, associated with them. So an open fermentation is not a bad idea here if you can control it. I would recommend putting a screen of some type over the top of the fermenter so that bugs don't get into it, so that things don't fall into it. 
uh, but otherwise it's really not too complicated. You'll see it create this enormous Krausen, and you can top crop that Krausen as well for fresh yeast if you wish to. Um, but once that Krausen starts to fall, then you'll need to rack that beer out from underneath the Krausen and move it to a sanitary secondary container because the Krausen may actually have things like bugs or other bits of debris in it that can eventually make their way back into the beer once the Krausen falls. So sometimes there is a little bit of an extra step to it, but otherwise it's really not that bad of a thing to do. Now with this particular beer, there's plenty of alternative yeasts to choose from, but I would recommend choosing one that is not a particularly high attenuating yeast, and also secondarily one that is a very high flocculator, which means that it'll drop out of uh, the beer very, very quickly and readily, which will enable it to be ready to be put on cask faster. There is another version of this particular yeast, I believe, WLP037 Yorkshire Squares, I think is the same strain. I'm not 100% positive on that, but I think it's the same strain. Um, and if not, it's a very similar one. However, there's also plenty of other liquid options out there that I haven't fully explored. Um, I have used Weiss 1968 London ESB before, and that's been really good. Um, and I have used the 1318 London Ale 3, of course, for other applications, but not only is that a good hazy IPA strain, it's also a very good English beer strain. Imperial yeast also has an excellent English strain in the form of pub, but that is going to be a bit of a higher attenuating strain, which is going to get you um, a bit drier of a beer at the end of the process. But it will drop out brilliantly clear very readily, which is important for cask ale. There's also a few dry offerings that I would recommend, uh, personally, either Lalaman London or Lalaman Windsor. Both of those are good, uh, nice estuary English strains that are going to drop out clean, but also not ferment all the way down. I would not recommend Nottingham for this particular beer because it will get very dry. With this particular type of beer, we don't want it to get excessively dry, and that can happen. You do want a little bit of sugar complexity left in there, um, and that's an important characteristic of these English yeasts, is having that little bit of residual maltotriose, uh, which it cannot ferment, uh, so that you get a, uh, a little bit of residual sugar complexity in the beer. This helps really increase that maltiness and that toffee character that you might want to expect from these types of beers. Regardless of which yeast you choose, it is very important to treat them accordingly. Um, they are English strains, which means that they do like to ferment a little bit on the cooler side relative to what most of us are used to. English yeasts tend to make berry-like and stone fruit esters uh, when they're fermented properly, but if they're fermented too hot, they can both create a ton of diacetyl as well as a uh, relatively rotten fruit kind of character, which is uh, not a pleasant thing in a beer. So I'd actually recommend pitching these at about 65 Fahrenheit and then slowly letting that temperature ramp up to about 68 Fahrenheit at the highest. Because of that, the fermentation might take a little extra time. You don't want the beer, though, to be excessively estery. That's just not right for the style. So that's my fermentation plan is 65 Fahrenheit for three days, and then we'll ramp up to 68 Fahrenheit for the remainder of the fermentation, which could be anywhere from five to 10 days, depending on how fast this is gonna go. But now we gotta talk about the cask portion of this. So this batch is gonna be split up in an interesting way. Um, I'm gonna use two containers for it. It's a five gallon batch. I'm gonna put one gallon into a one gallon mini keg, and I'm gonna put four gallons into a regular corny keg. And so what I plan to do is use that one gallon mini keg as a real cask. So what I'm gonna do is once the beer reaches within three gravity points of its final gravity, um, between three and five, I think, I'm gonna rack one gallon of beer off of the fermenter and put it into the cask. And for the purposes of this video, when I say cask, I mean this one gallon mini keg. Um, but I'm gonna seal it up and it's gonna naturally carbonate to that one to one and a half volumes of CO2 level uh, that you would have in a cask. Because I'm transferring the beer off of the fermentation early, um, I'm gonna leave that cask at about 68 Fahrenheit for another three to five days. That'll both finish the fermentation in the cask and, and also carbonate the cask to that appropriate level, and it'll clean up any diacetyl that's left over in the process. Once I feel like that fermentation has completed, which is totally guesswork, um, <laughs> I'm gonna crash it down to 55 Fahrenheit and let it sit there at 55 Fahrenheit undisturbed for about 24 to 48 hours. This is gonna give it time to clarify. Let all that yeast and sediment drop down to the bottom of the uh, mini keg. And then what's gonna happen is I'm gonna hook the liquid side up to my beer engine and I'm gonna put a gas disconnect on the uh, opposite side that's not hooked up to anything. So when I draw beer up from the cask uh, through my beer engine, it is replacing the empty space with oxygen. This is the exact same process that would occur if it was a cask drawing oxygen in through the spile in a shiv. 
um, to replace the empty volume. This, I believe, qualifies as real ale because it is naturally carbonated and it is served at 55 Fahrenheit with no excess CO2 ever touching the beer. The only difference in this case between that and real ale, I guess, is the actual container. But that drives that one gallon size home. Because of that oxygen ingress, you're going to spoil the beer within a week or two. So it is very important uh, that we don't necessarily give ourselves more volume than is necessary. So that one gallon, I think, is perfect for a week or two worth of nice cask ale before it goes bad. Now, the other four gallons is going to go into a corny keg, and I'm actually not going to transfer the other four gallons until the fermentation in the main fermenter is actually done. So, leaving the beer at 68 Fahrenheit until it's complete, then I'm going to transfer the beer into the corny keg, and I'm going to naturally carbonate the corny keg with a different method. I'm going to use Lalaman CBC1 cask and bottle conditioning yeast and add in about one ounce of dextrose into the whole thing to carbonate to that one to one and a half volumes of CO2, the same level of CO2 that should be in the other keg. I'm gonna wait until that one gallon cask has expired before I tap the four gallons. And when I set up the four gallons, I'm gonna put a cask breather on the gas side. What a cask breather is, is an attachment that hooks up to a CO2 tank. And so instead of replacing the uh, empty space in the keg as you pull out a beer with uh, regular ambient air, it's actually going to replace it with CO2 instead, although at atmospheric pressure, so you don't lose um, that nice low level of carbonation that is important for these beers. This, in theory, should still deliver a good cask ale without necessarily as much of a risk of spoiling. It'll probably last about a month um, at this level. I wouldn't expect it to go any further than that, though. Again, these will both be served through the beer engine at 55 Fahrenheit. And the whole point of this is to have the freshest possible beer, short of pouring it off the unitank directly. You get the best expression of flavors, and I'm really hoping that this turns out to be a really wonderful ale. And I'm hoping, I really am hoping, that it's enough to satisfy those of you across the pond who are looking for homebrewed real ale, but also to get folks who are not from England, Ireland, or Scotland, or any other place that has a lively cask culture to try it out for themselves. It's definitely Definitely worth it. And I'm really, really looking forward to this. I seriously cannot wait for it. So I will catch you guys in a few weeks when this thing is ready to be tapped. So until then, cheers. Fermentation for this beer actually went astoundingly fast. Um, I'd actually hit my final gravity in about seven days. Uh, which I didn't expect from this type of yeast, especially not at this type of temperature. Um, but overall, happy to see it. Once both kegs had been allowed adequate time to condition, I put them in my fermentation chamber and set the temperature to be about 55 degrees, which is the optimal temperature for serving cask ale. I allowed them about 24 hours at this temperature before venting the pressure using the pressure relief valve and then hooking up the beer engine to give them a taste. So the beer is called cheeky bugger and it comes in at 5% APV and about 33 IBUs. The color of the beer is a really nice dark gold uh, bordering on copper color. Um, it is about, I'd say, 85% clarified. Not really fully there yet, but close enough for something that has no findings in it, I'd say it's pretty good. It has a really amazing head on it, and that is entirely due to the use of the beer engine. It's just a fantastic, tight, really, really rich, creamy looking head on it um, that sticks around for the entirety of the session. There is actually a very thick layer of head that remains on the beer throughout the entire drinking session. Um, and I mean, it sticks around for hours. It is awesome. So I have this old school British mug here, the dimpled mug, um, also known as a skull crusher. And <laughs> I have this here because it's a little bit of a nod to history. It goes hand in hand with the historical aspect of the uh, hand pump that I just you know, served this off of. This is what bitter and mild and other beers like that used to be served from back in the day um, in the pubs. And in some pieces they still are. 
Admittedly, the clarity of the beer is not quite what I thought it would be, otherwise it would be a little bit more brilliant in this mug, but I think we can look past that in, at the moment here. I'm gonna go ahead and go in for aroma now. And the aroma on this is absolutely awesome. It is so full of rich toffee notes and a nice earthy hop character. Um, quite a bit of it, in fact. And then uh, a little bit of like a peach note from the yeast. But now, let's go in for a mouthfeel. This is what cask is really gonna make a difference for. Oh. Yup. <laughs> It's just so good. Mm. So there's a light carbonation in there. It just tingles your tongue a little bit, but that's about it. Um, it's not flat though, not at all. And that's a misconception that needs to be squashed because Cascale is neither warm nor flat. Those two things are wrong. It's like 70 degrees out right now. 55 degrees feels like a nice cold beer in that circumstance. And then on top of that, there is carbonation in this. There is life in this. But the other thing too is this has this really light, soft, creamy, velvety kind of character um, that really backs up the malt notes in a really special way. But it makes this so drinkable. It is incredibly, incredibly smooth um, and easy drinking. Like I could easily chug this entire 16 ounce pint right now. It's still a very hard thing to put a finger on exactly how that mouthfeel works, but it is, it is similar to an nitro pour, but it really is something very special and very unique, and you would absolutely lose that if you went to CO2 for this particular beer. It also adds a very small amount of body to the whole thing. So it does kind of make this a bit more medium bodied of a drink, I think, uh, overall, but it works really, really well with the flavors, which we might as well get into the flavors here. So this is actually a really interesting pint. Um, because of the yeast choices that I made, there are some, I would think, slightly unconventional flavors in here. But the malt character is lovely. I'm getting a really lovely toffee note, slight caramel note, um, just kind of this, uh, a little bit of like a butterscotch note, which I think might be yeast derived, and I'll get more into that in a minute here, but um, there's a nice toffee character to this. There's a nice biscuity, chewy maltiness um, with a little bit of a honey accent as well. It's quite delicious, and it sticks around for a long time. It remains on the palate even after the initial hop flavors and yeast flavors have kind of uh, subsided a bit. As far as hops go, um, I do find myself wishing there was more bitterness in this, and when it was young, the hot bitterness was quite nice. At the moment right now, it's got balance to it, it's got earthiness, it's got a little bit of herbal character, but it's overall kind of, um, missing a little bit of an element of hop bitterness, and I think that would be a nice thing to see in here in the future. If I would add maybe another 10 IBUs of hops, um, that would help a lot. And I think that's due to that cask serving process. But the biggest thing here that's really quite surprising and something that I think is, is actually really interesting is the yeast contribution. So the Timothy Taylor's yeast is a lot different than your typical like London ESB style yeast. It has a ton of stone fruit ester and stone fruit referring to specifically to things like peach and apricot, stuff like that. That is coming in force um, in this particular pint. Um, there is a slight touch of diacetyl in this. Um, I think that's my fault because I might've pushed it up to 68 a bit early um, or maybe not given it a long enough diacetyl rest. But that being said, it's really not too offensive. Um, actually, it kind of adds a little bit of roundness to everything. Otherwise though, the predominant characteristic of this is this like stone fruit peachy character. The peach blended with the earthy hops, blended with the uh, chewy toffee malty character, makes this quite the English beer. It's a quintessentially British character um, and something that actually works really, really, really well. This beer is absolutely delicious and I could easily see myself crushing two or three of these in a session at a pub somewhere in the Yorkshire countryside. You know, as this beer was young, the esters were a little bit intense, a little bit too much so, and there were characteristics of it that were a little overdone. However, as that cask had a little time on it, as there was a little bit of oxygen ingress into it, I think it actually really rounded things out and, and really came into its own. Um, and that's the magic of cellarmanship, and that's the magic of cask itself, because you have this evolving beer, and that's part of the whole experience.
So a few notes for potential improvement. I think firstly, um, just adding some more bittering hops would really help a lot. Um, add those bittering hops, you're gonna stick with the beer as it ages in the cask and that's gonna make a difference. Secondly, I would ferment this uh, using the same schedule, but I would definitely give it another few days at 65, maybe five days at 65 before ramping up to 68. And then give it a thorough diacetyl rest. Um, I think I might've rushed this one along a little bit, but that's certainly my fault, not necessarily on the recipe. Otherwise, the malt character is fantastic. The uh, Timothy Taylor's yeast is interesting, but very, very complex. And I would use it again, especially if you're going for a landlord style clone. And then lastly, the beer engine setup, you can't beat that. Um, because this is a Yorkshire style ale, I did put the sparkler on. Um, that's a Northern style of serving beer. That sparkler is that white bit on the end of the, uh, the beer engine gooseneck, which allows you to get that uh, rich kind of dissemination of bubbles into the beer. However, if you want to serve this as more of a Southern style, you can remove that uh, sparkler entirely, and then you'll have less head on the beer, but you'll also have a little bit more beer in your glass. There is so much beer culture in England. It's just so interesting to explore. And the more I do stuff like this, the more um, I learn about it. And it's, it's not something you hear about too much in general. This is simply so delicious. I'm gonna have to go get myself another pint. I have been plowing through these because they're just so darn easy to drink. Uh, but before I do, I do want to thank you guys for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed this dive into a uh, somewhat unknown by the rest of the world kind of subculture of brewing and uh, serving beer. It's definitely worth exploring if you're a home brewer trying to do this sorts of thing. Again, I do recommend checking out the cask system build video that I put out last week. So I will link that at the end of the video. You'll see that in the end screen. But otherwise, I really hope you explore this tradition. And um, you know, at the very least, if you ever find yourself in England, Ireland or Scotland and you see a hand pump or you see a cask with a gravity pour on it, get the beer that's on that cask or on that hand pump because it is absolutely worth it. And it means something to the brewers that are actually going through the effort of doing this uh, and making these ales in the old way. Anyway, guys, if you enjoy the video, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, and comment down below with your thoughts on this whole thing. I had so much fun making this video and doing this cask ale, and have you done something similar at home? If so, let us know. If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one. Uh, you can find this at the merchandise store. I have plenty of other designs that's all linked down in the description box. There's also a Patreon if you feel inclined to give to that. Uh, the Patreon is awesome. My Patreon supporters have been making a massive difference for... You know, upgrading the production quality of this channel and allowing me to do stuff like get the beer engine, build the cast system, that sort of stuff all comes from Patreon support and it's a massive help. If you feel inclined to, there's also channel memberships and the super thanks button for some other additional uh, benefits. Lastly, I have an Amazon store, link down in the description where you can find all of the equipment that I use to brew with that's on Amazon or film with, uh, stuff like that. If you're curious about it, it's all in that store, check it out. And also I'm available on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer. So check out those links for some more additional content. And you get a good idea of what's coming to the channel in the future. And if you're still here, thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of the video. And I appreciate your watch time because I put so much work into these things. And you know, the beer is great, but also it's great sharing as a part of this community. And I hope that people really do appreciate that. So until the next one, cheers. I gotta get another one of these, man. Mm.